Children, those who are working with the children, you are dismissed. So you can head out that way, out the door there. So with Pastor Mindy. There we go. They do that so quietly. I received a phone call uh, not long ago, and uh, the lady on the end of the line said, Pastor Josh, I am not happy. I, I, I need to get a divorce. Um, I'm, I'm going to pursue a divorce. I, I need you to help me. And I said, well, well, why are you calling me? I said, well, you, I'm not happy. I, I need to get a divorce. Like, what do you think about that? Like, what is God going to think about it? And I stopped and paused for a moment, and I said, well, um, the goal of marriage isn't to be happy. She said, well, that's ridiculous. (laughs) Then what is it about? Some of you are figuring this out. I figured this out now, right? She said, so what is it about? I said, well, Well, the goal of marriage in the Bible isn't actually to be happy. It's to display the love of God to your spouse and the world around you so that the glory of God might be lifted high. And on a personal note, the goal of marriage is to make you holy. And she said, well, so I'm just supposed to be miserable? Like, is that the goal? No, the goal is not to make you miserable. That's not the goal either, just in case any of you... We're wondering about that. But the goal isn't to make you happy. That's, that's what, oh, I haven't talked about Oprah in a while, right? That's what Oprah teaches you that marriage is about. That's what pop culture teaches what marriage is about. That's not what the Bible teaches. It's not about making you happy. And she said, well, I need to think about that. The point I was trying to make with her and and using this illustration is that we are told, right, to kind of react on our feelings, how we feel about a particular person or in a particular moment. This is what we're taught to do. This is a series where I'm asking us all to ask ourselves this question. Who are we becoming? And the question I want you to ask yourself this morning, if I were just to kind of give this morning a title, or if you were to think about the big idea of the message this morning, it's simply this, is are you becoming the type of person that is controlled by feelings that aren't from God? A few weeks ago, I introduced this passage here, Romans 12, 2. And here's what it says. It says, do not conform. In other words, right, do not do what everybody does. Do not seek to look like everyone else to the pattern, (laughs) to the habits that you see uh, around you, to the things that just kind of almost sometimes even naturally come as we look at the world or the culture. It's just kind of another way to think about that or to look at that but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so a few weeks ago, we talked about the importance of renewing your mind, and we really dove deep into the gospel. And I rarely tell people to go back and listen to a particular message, but that's a message that you may want to go back and listen to if you didn't hear it, because it kind of laid all the groundwork for what I'm trying to do in this series. But we're going to stay with the mind. I was going to go to the will this week, but we're going to stay here on the mind, because your feelings are connected to your mind. And I think... Right? We need to talk about our, our, our feelings uh, because so many of us, we are reacting um, out of feelings that aren't from God. And then it says, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, what I loved about my phone call with this lady was that <laughs> she told me that what I was telling her sounded ludicrous. It sounded ridiculous. It almost sounded insulting at the time. 
Because what she was telling me, yeah, her husband's a jerk. Or was being a jerk at the, that point in time. I don't blame her for not being happy or not feeling warm fuzzies towards her husband at that particular time. Even to the point where she wanted to separate. But I think the reason that it sounds most ludicrous is because we are taught. Right? Our, our culture teaches us to do what we feel. Like that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to react on the basis of however we feel at the moment. Or we're supposed to act towards people on the basis of how they make us feel about them in that moment. But the gospel and the scriptures do not tell us that we should always honor our feelings. In fact, Paul, when he's writing to the Philippian church... He says this about a, a group of people that basically are just kind of honoring their feelings, just kind of doing whatever they feel. He says this in chapter 3, verse 19. He says, their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with their mindset on earthly things. Now, he says their God is their belly, right? We don't talk about our belly a lot when feelings, but we talk about it our gut. Right? Uh, they who, who would have felt something visceral here. That's when we talk about our feelings kind of being visceral, like deep down, when we feel it in our belly. And so what Paul is saying is this group of people who aren't following the Lord, they are doing what they feel. And he says what they're doing in what they feel, he says they're glorying in their shame. And otherwise, they're, they're celebrating what they feel, although it's not from God. In fact, it says it's, it's shameful. And what he says about the shamefulness is where does it come from? It actually comes from their minds being set on earthly things. Now that doesn't mean, like I said a few weeks ago, that we aren't concerned about what happens here on earth. It just means that we are more concerned with what the world or the culture teaches us than what God gives us. And Paul then, he starts the sentence with this idea of what happens when we allow our minds to get like this, where we are just reacting on whatever gut feeling we have at the moment, he said it ultimately brings destruction. And so all of us, we should beware of the type of person who we are becoming if we are reacting always based on our feelings. Now, before some of you start to say, well, Josh, you don't care about my feelings, it's obvious. My wife would probably agree with you sometimes. Um, let's define what I mean by feelings here. And let's talk about our feelings together. Feelings encompass a, a wide range of things that are felt. Specifically, sensations, desires, and emotions. We feel warm, hungry, an itch, fearful. Feelings include dizziness and thirst, sleepiness and weariness, sexual interest and desire, pain and pleasure, Loneliness and homesickness, anger and jealousy, but also comfort and satisfaction, a sense of power and accomplishment, curiosity and intellectual gratifications, compassion for others and the enjoyment and beauty and delight in God. They're complex. They're actually really hard to describe and they're many. And feelings in and of themselves, I'm not saying that feelings are bad. They're not. Feelings are what move us. And we enjoy being moved by our feelings. We enjoy feeling a certain way and then acting upon it in any, uh, any moment that we might come across. So we aren't creatures, we aren't people that should be removed from our feelings. Feelings for healthy people are inescapable. So if you are healthy, you should have feelings. We're not called to be stoics that are emotionally remo removed from each other or our circumstances. We should be able to react to the world around us. We should feel certain things. Being numb, in fact, or not feeling is a sign of depression or disengagement with the world that you see around you. Our feelings should be engaged, and they should be understood, and they should be used properly. An example of this, let me show you an example of this, is the Good Samaritan. So the Good Samaritan is a story found in Luke 2. And Jesus is trying to answer a question uh, for a lawyer. The lawyer asks a question, basically, uh, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says to love God and, and love your neighbor. And then he asks, the lawyer follows up with a follow-up question. He says, well, what does it mean to love your neighbor? And 
Jesus then tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, a, a priest, there's a man that falls in the ditch and he's uh, beaten up by robbers, basically, and a priest and a Levite pass by, but then the Samaritan helps. And I want to show you a little bit of what Jesus says about the Samaritan then as he comes across the man in the ditch. Here's what Jesus says. He says, then a despised. Now, I, I didn't highlight the word despised there, but I probably should have. The, the NLT actually adds that there. Uh, it's not actually in the Greek, but it is implied in the story. So uh, an interesting thing about this, that if you were a, a first century reader, or if you were the person hearing this, when Jesus talks about the Samaritan, he's actually here having the lawyer feel something towards this particular person, because Jewish people did not like Samaritans. And so here's the idea basically, is that this Samaritan is despised, so this man immediately is going to kind of feel something about this Samaritan. And the Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, look at what the, who, what the Samaritan did, the Samaritan felt compassion for him. So the Samaritan looked at the man in the ditch, and he felt compassion to him. Now, that, feeling compassion there, that is in the Greek, that is in the text, and Jesus is using that word on purpose. He's, he's telling us that this man saw the person who was hurting, the Samaritan saw the man in the ditch who was hurting, and this motivated him to do something about it. It came out of how he felt about the man in the ditch. And that's not a mistake for us to see that this man felt a particular way and felt strong enough to see the man in the ditch, to help the man in the ditch, although it was going to cost him a great bit. You, you th remember what the, the Samaritan did. right? He went and got the man, helped repair or, 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 or bandage up some of his, the wounds that he had. He puts it on his own animal, and then he takes him to the nearest town, and he tells the person who's going to take care of him, like, I'll pay for whatever needs to happen. And then he leaves after that, presumably. In Matthew 9, we are told that Jesus looks at the crowd. The crowds of people are coming to them, some who need healed, some are broken, some who are are sick, and then others who just need to be taught about God. And he looks at them, and what we're told is that Jesus had compassion on the crowd. Jesus also gets angry when he walks into the temple, when he sees the, the, the people in the temple exploiting people, selling goods in the, in the place where often the foreigners would travel to, uh, to worship God. And Jesus gets angry, and he overturns tables. And so feelings in and of themselves are not bad. It's what it means to be human. But there are destructive feelings. There are, de there are feelings that will destroy who you want to become. See, here's what I believe about everybody in this room, most people watching or listening, is that you want to become a particular type of person. And I know that if you are a Christian, you want to become a transformed person, right? You want to transform your mind. You do not want to be conformed to the world. You do not want to be like everyone else. You don't want to look like everyone else. You don't want to just feel a particular way and then act upon it. And so we don't want to give in to the destructive patterns of the world. This ultimately just leads to bad things. James makes this clear in James 4, uh, verses 1 and 2. He says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not that your passions are at war with you? You desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet, and you cannot attain. You fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And so what James here says, he said, what's all the sources of your fights, your divisions, your wars, all of these sorts of things? They're out of control passions. They're out of control feelings. And so it's really important for all of us as we think about our feelings, as we think about our passions, to make sure we have the right ones. The wrong ones are destructive. So I want to spend the rest of our time this morning just teaching. How do we get rid of our destructive feelings? How do we get rid of our destructive feelings? Here's the first thing that we all should do. Identify, identify how you feel in certain situations or about certain people. Just identify it. I pointed out that in the NLT uh, the, the writer there, the translator there, takes a little, uh, um, kind of gives at liberty there and says that the despised Samaritan is the one who's hot, or stopped in the ditch there. 
And the lawyer was asking about who my neighbor is. And immediately, or what Jesus does in the story, he says, well, this is a, a Samaritan. So the lawyer then immediately is going to start thinking, like, I don't even like this person. Let's help it. Or even group of people. Think about the Samaritans. Jesus used Samaritans not because there's an individual Samaritan that, that he didn't like. This lawyer would have not liked any Samaritan. So Jesus is pointing out here that there's a whole group of people that you don't like in this particular time. When he's trying to answer the question, who is my neighbor? Who must I love? Now on a personal point, have you ever thought about the reasons why maybe the Levite or the priest didn't stop to help the man in the ditch? Were they afraid? Was fear, right, their dominant feeling? I mean, think about this. What, what would happen to them? They're on a road. Nobody else is presumably around. There's a man lying in a ditch. He didn't get there by himself. Bandits, thieves, are the ones who put the man in the ditch. Where are they? Are they still around? If the, the Levite and the priest stopped, would something happen to them? Is, is, it, is it fear? I mean, is there a trap? Or maybe they're just really important. I, I mean, you know, they've got a family. They've got, they, they've got a help at the temple. And so they're afraid, right, if, if, they, do, if they help and they're not able to go home or help others, right, well, what will happen to others that I'm supposed to care for? Or what, what about just the fear of what others would say? They presumably are maybe on the way to the temple or uh, to help lead in worship. And, and it's really, you, you had to wash. You had to have some ceremonial washing. You had to have a, a number of things take place before you entered the temple if you had blood on you. And so maybe they were afraid that the other Levites or the other priests would want to exclude them from leading in worship for a period of time until they cleansed themselves further. Maybe they felt contempt for the man in the ditch. Presumably, just reading in the story, we don't really know this. It's a parable. It's, it's not something that actually happened. It's just Jesus using a story to, for, for us to think about, which is what we're doing right now. Presumably, the Le priest and the Levite, they're the first people to pass the man in the ditch. How long had this man been there? When did they get there? Did he get there overnight? Is this first thing in the morning? Are the priest and the Levite walking by? Are they the first ones to walk by this man in the morning, so they look at this man and they think, well, why was he out at night? <laughs> you know what happens at night on these roads. People get hurt. People get injured. Right? Nothing good happens after dark. So they may have had excuses in their head. The person basically deserved it. We have all sorts of automatic feelings in certain situations, and not all of them are good. They're not. But we have to identify them. We need to know how we feel about certain people, groups of people, individuals, certain situations before we prejudge, or before we know actually how the people got in the ditch themselves. And so identify how you feel about certain situations, but then we need to do this. We need to replace, not repress our feelings. We need to replace, not repress our feelings. So here's what I'm not going to ask you to do, right, if you have certain feelings. I, I'm not going to ask you to pretend they don't exist. That's why I just asked you to identify them. Right? What I'm trying to teach you this morning is that we don't have to act on all of our feelings, whether they feel good at the time or negative. What we should do is we should replace our ungodly feelings with godly ones. One of the ways to do this is actually to reason. God is a God of reason. God is a God of truth. We should listen to other people. We should sit down and dialogue with other people. We should try to understand why people disagree with us. doesn't mean you eventually have to agree with them. But we should seek truth. We should seek to get at the facts. 
we should speak and have dialogue and debate and reason. I feel like a lot of us, or our culture, is kind of losing that to a certain extent. One of the things that I'm doing right now, just encourage people to maybe to sit down with people who are a little different than them. And this man isn't that different than me. He just looks different than me in this current cultural situation that we are in. But Pastor Brendan Glass across the street here, who lives, leads a primar- primarily uh, black congregation, uh, I don't know, some of you may have seen this. We've been starting to post this. We're starting to just have conversations. We're just calling them candid conversations on race. We see eye to eye on a lot of things, but there are things that I'm sure, certainly sure that we are going to see differently about. And we're starting to get into some bigger topics here in the weeks to come or some, I guess, more topics that just get people in trouble in general. But we can't stop talking to each other. And I know not all of you have somebody maybe that you feel safe with having conversations or learning from or maybe even challenging uh, back and forth with. But we have to be people who are willing to have conversations, people who are willing to talk to one another, people who are willing to reason together. The second thing we want to do is we try to replace our feelings and not repress our feelings is we have to... We have to take these ungodly feelings that we find occasionally as we have them, and they have to become subordinate to the godly feelings. So yes, I might feel a certain way, but if God tells me I should feel a different way and I don't feel that yet, right, I'm going to make it subordinate. I'm going to do what God asks me to do, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try to feel the way God would want me to feel. Well, how do you just will yourself to feel? That's a good question. How do you will yourself to feel? Well, you have the Spirit of God in you. You have the Spirit of God in you. And you have to act according to the Spirit of God. You have to replace the Spirit of God or the Spirit of flesh with the Spirit of God. And you are able to do that, and you can do that. Because you have the fruits of the Spirit. Now, when I talk about the fruits fruit of the Spirit, it's not fruits, it's fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit are general really attitudes that we have. It's not, they're not really feelings in and of themselves. It's just an, they're attitudes that we carry along with us. And the first three are really important to us if we consider uh, what we're talking about this morning. Their love, their joy, and their peace. We have this. It's, it's not like you have one and don't have the other. The Spirit gives you this if you're walking in step with the Spirit. That's why it's just fruit. It's not fruits. And so there's love. There's love. Love should be above any feeling that we have. We should think about how do we love in this situation and what should I feel about this situation here or this person. So what is love? Baby, don't hurt me. I can't sing. That's the only part of that song I know anyways. But actually, it's not a bad definition of love. It's not not the best, right? I wouldn't just stop there. Baby, don't hurt me. But it's not that bad of a definition. Love is the will for good, is to will good for someone or something. In other words, like to love is to promote the good of somebody else for their own sake. It's to want good for somebody. It's contrary to malice. It's not to want harm for them. And so love delights in the good, delights in good for the other person. While an evil person takes no pleasure when something good happens to someone else. So where does, where does love come from? Love comes from God. Where does goodness come from? Goodness comes from God. This is, this is Genesis 1 stuff. Right? God is creating the earth and he looks at it and what does he say? says this is good. Right? God wants good for the earth. God wants good for you. God created Adam and Eve, and he looks at it and says, it is good. Unfortunately, we have the fall. We have Genesis 3 and everything after, after that. And so not everything we do is good. But as followers of Jesus Christ and as people who come to worship God, we are people who are, have been redeemed, are being redeemed, and are working to redeem God's good creation and God's good order, including our culture and our world. Yet, good is not natural. 
for most people. We have fleshly desires, and instead of, instead of allowing our feelings to be dictated by the love of God, right, we allow lust to creep in and desires to take over. And love is not the same thing as lust. Let me give you this example. Is that uh, Dallas Willard uses this in his book, The Renovated Heart. Somebody might say they love ice cream. What they really mean by that is they lust after ice cream. Is they desire ice cream. They don't really wish ice cream well. Right? You can't, you don't, you just don't. You don't wish it well. You wish it tastes good. Right? But you don't wish it well. You don't really love it. And so whenever we think about our feelings in that way or being able to react, reacting to something on that way, what has happened is love is actually given way to lust or desire. And this is kind of basically how we talk about love now. And we allow our feelings, then, if we feel lovingly towards something, it means we feel good towards something or we feel happy uh, about something here. And what the Bible teaches is, no, there, there's a higher love. There's a better love. There's a better way. John uh, basically says this. This is how the culture works. He says, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father but the world. In other words, right, desire and lust in that way, it, it, it's not from God. It's what it means to conform to the pattern of this world. When we give in to our desires or our feelings or at any given moment, that's what we are doing. Pride, too, he says, so there's the pride of life. Pride is the presumption that all of our desires should be satisfied while ignoring God's standard and doing so at the expense of others. And it's common to behave this way. This is why we fear one another instead of love one another. We feel as if we cannot trust people to do the right thing on our behalf for many reasons. People are abused, they're abandoned, they're left in the ditch, and we do this to people we say we love. I mean, simply put, someone who is controlled by their feelings, their fleshly feelings, can't be trusted. On the other hand, people who allow their feelings to become subordinate to love, can be trusted. People looked at Jesus and, you know, you, you love, when you read through the Bible, you see like children rushing to Jesus. Why? Because they knew he loved him. They knew they, he, they knew he loved them. Would people say the same thing about you? And not just the people that you lust to have good relationships with. I don't mean in a sexual way. But like people that you love and want to love you back. But would people generally, who don't even know you that well, right, would they say you feel lovingly towards them? Right? Have you become that type of person? Right? Is that the type of person that you want to become? I hope so. And here's the thing. You have the resource to become that sort of person. You have the spirit in you that's bringing about the fruits of the spirit. The fruit, I see, I even want to call it fruits. The fruit of the spirit in you. The spirit is pointing us towards Jesus, God's son, in which our love flows out of so we, because we have this divine relationship with the spirit and with the son. And we sometimes just need to be reminded of how this relationship works. And so John writes about this in 1 John 4, 7, and 8. And I'm going to read verse 19, too. And it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. We love because he first loved us. Four things about love here, just to remind you of this morning. God loves you. God loves you. God is love. We're told that he loves us. Love is from God because God is love. And we know God loves us 
Because he willed our good by sending his son to die on the cross in our place and rising again on the third day so that we know we have life through Jesus Christ. God loves you. Second thing that you should be reminded of is that you love God. You love God. We love because he first loved us. And we, we love God out of his love for us. God loves you, you love God, and God doesn't just command you to love him, right? It is a command in the scriptures, but God gives you the reason, the way for you to love him. Because his son paid the debt that we paid, that we owed, right? God has placed his spirit in you, right? The, the spirit is always praising Jesus, right? If the spirit of God is in you, you are loving God. You have to. It's part of who you've become. It's part of being that transformed person. So you love God. Now, if you love God, you will love other people. Do you catch that? Let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. And verse 8 says, anyone who does not know God, right, does not, or, yeah, anyone who does not love does not know God. If you don't love, if your feelings don't flow out of the love that God has given us, right, what we are actually told here is that we don't know God. Think about that for a second. But you do love others because God's spirit is at work in you. Sometimes we just need to be reminded of God's spirit at work in our hearts and our lives. If you have been born again, God's love reigns in you. And so your feelings, if there's not love, it needs to become subordinate to the love of God. And the fourth thing about love I want to remind you of is that you are confident that this love is the redeeming power of God in the world. If you want to see the world, the culture, whatever, your neighborhood, your, your family change, you have got to love. So as we think about this, more than any policy, more than elevating any politician, the love of God must be elevated in your life. People must know that you feel lovingly towards them and want good for them. You should be becoming the type of person who seeks good for other people simply because you love them. People should know that even if you disagree with them. The second fruit that's described is joy. And joy is attached to love. There's a reason that we're just going to get all these three. They all flow from one another. It's love. It's joy. Joy is attached to love. It's rooted in the reality that we know that God loves us and intends good for us. We feel and experience joy when the Spirit empowers us to fix our mind on God's good promises that are given to us that we know that will bring us life. This is why Paul in prison, Paul's in prison when he writes to the Philippians. He writes to the people that their God is their belly. In other words, they just do whatever their gut tells them to do. He says that brings destruction. But, but he says those who go to the Lord in prayer, those who seek the Lord, those who fixate their mind on the Lord because they know the Lord is near to them in this moment and the Lord will come again. This is what he's able to say to them. And this is what he is doing while in prison, knowing that he's going to die in prison. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say it, rejoice. To rejoice is to express joy. He's saying this joy doesn't flow from your current circumstances, but it, it flows actually from how we feel deep down. That the spirit is even deeper than our gut here. And it's not based on our circumstances. It goes beyond that. Maybe if you are constantly unhappy, if you're angry or impulsive, it's because you're focusing on your current circumstances. You're focusing on your gut. And if that's the case, right, you, you are going to be troubled. The way to have a deeper joy, the way to allow your feelings to be transformed is not to focus on your circumstances, but to seek the Lord. To tap into his spirit. To praise him. To rejoice for what he's promised you. To know that he promises you good. That's who God is. That's what God does. Yeah, you, you may be sad. You may be weeping now. But as the psalmist said, joy comes in the morning. 
today, tonight, this moment may not be what I expected. This may not be what I want. And this makes me feel awful. But there's a day coming. And I know that God doesn't even mean this for evil, for my evil, but he means it for good. You can have joy that transcends your circumstance and help you rise above those feelings. Third is peace. Peace just means that you no longer have this struggle that can never be won, either inwardly or outwardly. Right? You're not gritting your teeth every time a certain subject is brought up. To be at peace is a great attainment. And I'm, I'm becoming fairly convinced that most people are not at peace with themselves or with others. This seems to be fairly evident. And this is because true peace comes from God. It comes from knowing that you are at peace with God. It comes from knowing that God loves you, God has forgiven you, God accepts you, and that you are God's child. Romans 5.1 says this, as we've been justified by faith. We have peace with God. You have it through Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into his grace. He's given us grace in this, in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope and glory of God. Our peace comes not from knowing how others feel about us, but rather being assured that we have peace with God and we know about how God feels about us. God loves us. God is gracious in his nature towards us. God is merciful. And if no one else, if no one else will be gracious or merciful to me in whatever moment it might be, I have an abundance of mercy from God. You have all the grace you need from God. When nobody else loves you, you have all the love that you need from God. And that can bring you peace. You're not worried about others condemning you. That can bring peace you peace. If you believe that, right, you don't have to always stand in condemnation over other people, which often brings more strife. You can be at peace. One of the reasons that I'm in this series is because I just look around and I, I feel like I see so many people becoming the type of person that they don't want to become. This is a weird time in our history. It just is, right? We're, we're struggling with a lot of different things right now. I mean, I, I think God, like, there's not war on the home front or anything like that, like physical war. But people are really struggling. As I have conversations with people and get on social media, which is just awful half the time, right? What I see is I just, I just see people, like, becoming people that they don't want to become, I think. And any time that you're going through struggle, any time you're going through a difficult time, it's transformative. It, it really is. And we have to ask ourselves, right, as we struggle with everybody else, who are we going to become during this time? Who are we going to become? I know I want to become the type of person who takes all my feelings that are not from God and makes them subordinate to God's spirit in my life. I want people to know that whether I agree with them or not, whether I like what they're doing or not, that I love them. I, I want people to see that my feelings flow out of not joy from my current circumstances, but joy that I get from God. And it's a struggle to be at peace right now. It's a struggle to know what to say or what to do, whether it be with your family, the church, people in the church, all of those sorts of things. But I need to allow my feelings to come out of this place of peace that I have with God. That's the type of person that I want to be transformed and two. I see this as a moment of time in history, and I keep telling myself, like, Josh, this is going to make you a better pastor if you allow it to. Will you allow this moment in time to make you 
a better person. And I don't just mean a better person, right? But somebody who is anchored in Christ. Somebody who is allowing Christ to do a work in your heart right now. That he might not, that, that, that you might not even noticed last year at this time. So I'm going to end with this question. Who are you becoming? Are you becoming the type of person who is controlled by fleshly feelings, just by your gut in that moment of time? Or are you the type of person who is transformed by the renewal of your mind so that you will feel what God feels towards yourself and others? I hope that you will renew your mind this morning by allowing your feelings to be transformed by the Spirit of God and not conformed by the patterns of this world. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we pray that during this time of worship as we've come and sang songs to you, as we spent time in prayer and in fellowship with one another as we look around this room, I pray, Father, that all of us together that we would not conform to the pattern of this world. But that we'd be transformed by the renewals, renewing of our mind. And this morning, Father, we pray that you transform our feelings. That you would help us to feel rightly about things and about other people. That the fruit of the Spirit would reign in our life and that all of our feelings would become subordinate to the attitudes of the fruit that you give us of love and joy and peace. I pray for all of us who certainly struggle to feel as you should feel and sometimes are even confused about how we should feel in a particular situation. And so I pray that by the help of your spirit, that you would help us to navigate the current situation that we are in, the pandemic, with the social unrest, with our political climate. Some of us have different things going on in our family life, and we don't want to be dominated by often ungodly and fleshly feelings towards them as well. So help us to navigate those relationships in a godly way. We pray that you forgive us as we, Scott talks about repentance earlier in, 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 in his prayer. We pray that you forgive us for times where we have allowed our feelings to reign and just to do what we feel is right, which has brought destruction on our lives and those around us, which has led others not to trust us. May we become the type of people who are trustworthy because others know that we will try to do the right thing for them because we love them. And Father, we love you. That's why we are here. That's why we read your word together. That is why we praise you. So let all we do flow out of our love for you. And may others see that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.